All right. Which again, yeah. you know. Network quality. It went from terrible to average. That's good. Now average. <laughs> Here we are. <coughs> Big Red Studio. I'm going to show you guys around before the show starts. This is... Uh, I hope so. Yeah. <coughs> no viewers yet, but here's the audience. And here is here is the control room. This is Billy, Hello. the engineer. And David's recorded so many records here, and it's uh, wonderful to have him here with a bunch of people. Yes. So hello to the world. Hello, world. Hopefully, so far there's zero people watching, but I think they can watch it again later, so. Okay. We got a seat at the outside. This is uh, the outside. I'm showing people around. Here we go. Let's, oh, that's it. Yeah, that's the outside. Beautiful. Oh, and suddenly from zero to nine, that's good. Okay. The actual show starts shortly, but I thought I'd, I thought we'd just show you around a little bit. Here's the setup. Yeah. So we're uh, we're set to begin in uh, about a minute or so. Let's, yeah, last dash, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So, um, this, so there are uh, just a couple of announcements before we commence with the musical segment of the, uh, <laughs> which is, so, out, so in the, in the control room over there, um, people are very welcome to, uh, sit in those chairs and hang out and, and uh, experience the thing from over there. But then you'll be hearing me through a speaker, but they're nice speakers. Um, and, um, and if anybody, uh, the, oh, at the end of the hall to the right is the bathroom. And if anybody needs the bathroom or wants to go out during the show, then uh, you're of course welcome to do so, but ideally during the applause, not during the song. And if any, if any, because we are actually recording this, so you're you're uh, you're singing along and you're clapping is most enthusiastically welcome, uh, but but walking past during the song is not, and uh, and cell phones are not welcome either. And if you uh, if you have a cell phone, it, it's also it's. It's not just the noise, but also the interference with the electronics. So if you can put it into flight mode or turn it off, then that would be great. Unless you're a doctor on call or something, um, <laughs> you probably don't need it. So yeah, what else? Uh, I think. Uh, oh, and uh, in, in the entrance, uh, in the entrance way, there are uh, CDs and T-shirts, and there's a donation basket, and suggested donation is anything. So. You know, zero is great, ten is great, twenty is great, whatever. And um, then you're great. And oh, thank you. <laughs> so and then uh, this is um, I you know normally when I do a concert I would do sort of two sets, but I'm just going to do one longer set instead of two because this is also being broadcast on um, the internet. And uh, and then so if there's a break, then it's kind of awkward when you're. You know, <laughs> it's like okay, look at the chair for the next twenty minutes. You know? um, actually, I did time. I I have actually rehearsed the set a number of uh, times, as you might guess, and uh, and it is exactly an hour if I don't talk. Except I, I will talk, so, so it'll, it'll 
it'll be more than an hour. Uh, but I, I probably won't talk excessively. But depends on opinions. <clears throat> so, and I'll probably be doing songs that you've never heard because it's mostly stuff I wrote in the past few months. And um, and and if you are a regular. Uh, follower of the news, then you'll be familiar with the subject material. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, yeah, so and anytime, uh, you, if you catch the chorus or something, you want to sing along, you know, don't worry about the recording. That's a, it's great. We love it. You know, it's a live thing. Don't, don't worry about being quiet. You know, we sing, clap, anything, you know, like that. It's good. Okay. And then, oh, so yeah. And I was also thinking, normally, I wouldn't normally stop like that, but I just realized I shouldn't start the song by talking, so that, you know, we'll pretend we're sort of in a studio and, you know, start it like, okay, I'm not very good at, I have never done this before, a live concert in a studio, this is the first, I think, yeah, I like it, <laughs> it's a, like optimal house concert environment, I think. <laughs> He was born a rich man, then he got richer still By driving politicians on Capitol Hill By declaring bankruptcy, by working with the mob By causing lots of Americans to lose their union jobs By exporting industries to sweatshops overseas By acting like an idiot on national TV But now add to his accomplishments one more impressive trait He's God's gift to the caliphate God's gift to the caliphate. In between his beauty pageants and gambling casinos and pretending to be a self-made man in films and TV shows, Donald Trump decided he should run for president. For jihani recruiters, his campaign was heaven sent. It's a war between religions, a civilizational fight. That's what Daesh says, and Donald Trump says that's right. All you Muslims, stay out of here. Just go join Islamic State. He's God's gift to the caliphate. God's gift to the caliphate. He's not much for statistics, he doesn't have the time Between harassing women and committing corporate crime But he's a savvy gambler, he knows how to play the game He's got a list of groups ready made for him to blame He doesn't just hate Muslims, he hates Mexicans as well And he's prepared to win the contract for the wall he wants to sell But the terrorists around the world think he's really great He's God's gift to the caliphate. God's gift to the caliphate. The future of the world may be technically unknown, but if the past is any indication, then Trump has set the tone, along with 27 governors and Congress people by the score, who, if we turn the clock back to 1944, would be turning back the refugees just like we did back then. Hey, that worked out so well, why not just do it all again? Because what the world clearly needs is more vile bombs and hate. And God's gift to the caliphate. God's gift to the caliphate. Thank you. And um, if you, uh, some somebody at the Guardian or someplace was doing a. Um, analysis of uh, articles in the mainstream newspapers in the United States and Britain in 1939 compared to now. And, um, and it, in a nutshell, if you change the words uh, Jewish and communist to uh, Muslim and terrorist, the articles could be just wow. you know, written the same day. inspired a song. It's 1939 and the boats are coming, but we can't have them here. That much at least is clear. Our economy is poor. We can't just open up the door. We've got problems of our own. They should just leave us alone. They're a tribalistic race. 
They keep a separate space. They don't really integrate. They'll be a burden on the state. Watch before it is too late. It's 1939 and the boats are coming. But if we let them land and acquiesce to their demands, we'll soon be overrun. Our Christian country will be done. They should just take the tram closer by to Amsterdam. Keep their problems in the region. This invading legion, enemies within our ranks with names like Rosenberg and Frank. Watch that water that you drank. It's 1939 and the boats are coming. But they must stay away. In the newspapers they say they don't believe in Christ the Lord And they're jumping overboard, crossing borders in a swarm They'll never be reformed, it's a Trojan horse attack And we've got to send them back There may be Nazis in the hall, answering Hitler's call These Jews are Germans after all It's 1939 and the boats are coming That was a common theme in the press in the 30s, was uh, these Jews are Germans. They might be Nazis. That seems, hi, come on in, come on in. And um, for the newcomers as well, there's, you're also welcome to sit in the, in the control room. And, um, and if you have a cell phone, please turn it off. Sorry about how difficult the place is to find. I don't know. If that's <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so um, I used to, um, in, when I was a kid, I did a little bit of uh, computer programming, um, just enough to learn things like what an if-then statement is. You know, if-then statement in, in computer, in basic, is like uh, if this happens, then this happens. You know. You uh, tell the computer to do something if, you know, and I guess it's a f logic concept. I never studied logic. I only studied computer programming, so all I know about logic is, you know, <laughs> but, but I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about refugees. A lot of these songs are about refugees. I've been thinking about refugees for a long time, <clears throat> especially since it's been in the news and, you know, they're walking down the highways in Europe where I spend a lot of time. If you've heard the news of the beheadings, seen the planes on bombing runs, read of the carnage at the weddings, heard about these men with guns, seen the photos of buildings mangled, the footage of the fields burned, the shots of bodies left entangled. There should be a lesson learned if you saw them walking into the cafes, standing in the crowd. If you've watched the replays, heard them shouting out aloud, death to all the unbelievers. Allo Akbar, God is great. If you've heard the screams there in the theater as they died for the caliphate. If you saw the flames hit the towers, saw the smoke that filled the sky, smelled the candles and the flowers, looked up and wondered why someone would be hellbent to kill so many fellow men. If you wondered what they once meant when they said never again, then you know why they are fleeing. There's a ringing in your ears, then you see what they are seeing. You know why they're coming here, then you understand your task now is to open up the door. Then you, you must give them shelter from the war. Then you, you must give them shelter from the war. said yesterday on Democracy Now!, if your neighbors are running out of, if you set fire to your neighbor's house and they run out onto your lawn, you shouldn't complain. But, um, which I love it when somebody can, I mean, there's, there's a song and that's a perfect hook line, you know. 
when somebody can sum something up. That's a good thing about Twitter, at least, you know, is that you, you really need to think about how to say something in 140 characters, and that's actually a really valuable thing to work on. As much as I hate social media. <laughs> I think the most inspiring event of last year happened last month in um, a little town on the Somali-Kenya border. the country to an arid northern little desert town. If you leave early in the day, you'll still be on your way long after the sun is going down. It began as just a ride to the other side, but then was interrupted by the sound of the shattering of glass as the driver tried to pass the men with guns there on the dusty desert ground. There were two already dead, another shot as she fled. No question here whose lives were now at stake. When all is said and done, it is instances like this one, when every move is one that just might make or break. All passengers get out, men with guns began to shout, you Christians now get up against the wall. But then everyone stayed still, saying now do as you will, you may leave. You may kill us all. It wasn't far away, just over a year ago today, when people were massacred exactly in this manner. The pattern, it was clear. All the Muslims here would be safe if they just stood beside this banner. Headscarves passed from hand to hand among this human band live together or together fall and then nobody moved showing each of them approved of saying you may leave or you may kill us all it wasn't set in stone there's no way they could have known that this time this act of solidarity would see the gunmen leave goals left unachieved on the border there in Mandera County but sometimes you take a chance then at a second glance you see you've changed the world with the passing of a shawl there are those who will remember those who on one day in December said you may leave You may leave, or you may kill us all. You may leave. I was, um, two months over the fall looking at Syrian refugees walking down the highways and um, and and hanging out at refugee centers well in towns near near the refugee centers where, where Syri we were doing a lot of events in Germany inviting refugees to come which uh, I wish we had I think it would have been nice to have more Arabic music basically um, because it's just so weird for them to be in Germany from their perspective. I mean, these young men who don't speak English or German coming into towns where people are very welcoming, but the average age is about 70. And so you have, you know, you, these 70 year old Germans trying to relate to these young Syrian guys who don't speak Ger English or G German. And it's, it's a challenge for everybody. And um, I think people are rising to the challenge brilliantly uh, on all sides of the equation. But um, but I was thinking, and, you know, it, I love what the German government is doing right now, and uh, and I have a 
deep admiration for <coughs> the chancellor in a way that seems kind of weird given that she was just trying to destroy the Greek economy last year. <laughs> but, you know, people are complicated. But, um, but you know, the... Uh, but far more, far more inspiring than what uh, is happening uh, in Germany right now is um, what happened uh, after the king of Spain passed the Alhambra uh, decree in 1492. And uh, people are mostly unaware of what happened next, and this is what happened next. In 1492, Colombo crossed the ocean. Only one of many horrors that would then be set in motion. As his men cut limbs of arrowheads and burn children at the stake, plundering a continent for God's sake. In 1492, when King Ferdinand won Granada. He passed a law known as the Edict of Alhambra. It was as the landlords wanted, as his gracious God had willed, that any Jew in Spain had three months to leave or else be thousand Europeans became refugees and headed east across the Mediterranean Sea. In 1492, they were starving and bereft. The king said they'd be safe up until the time they left. But Christian Europeans cut them open with their swords, searched their stomachs for gold, and dumped them overboard. When 800,000 Europeans became refugees and headed east across the Mediterranean Sea. In 1492, the Sultan sent his fleet to go rescue Sephardim after the Ottoman defeat. Hundreds of thousands of people who knew their deaths were near were rescued by Muslims and taken to Izmir. In 1492, the Sultan said, that's fine. If they'd impoverish their kingdom just to enrich mine. The Sultan also passed an edict. He said, welcome home. Now treat your new neighbors as if they were your own. When 800,000 Europeans became refugees and headed east across the Mediterranean Sea and headed
headed east across the Mediterranean Sea. In 1492. Sorry, it's also depressing. You know, I write funny songs sometimes, but it's, it's not been a good year for funny. He grew up in the church in the AME and sitting on his perch on his grandfather's knee. He became an athlete and an actor as well. He was in the driver's seat. Only time would tell the things he might achieve as he signed up to go travel overseas to Desolation Row in Afghanistan, where he had more than his fill. Oh, the things that made the man named Anthony Hill. He went off and served his nation, came back troubled in his head, got on some medication, felt like the walking dead. He witnessed things in his deployment that no one should ever see. Among whatever else that meant, he had PTSD. He tried hard to proceed, but he did it because he knew if he wanted to succeed, it's what he had to do. He spoke up in support of those they call ill. He was quick with a retort, was Anthony Hill. Of how the world should be, he had many visions. When he looked at the mirror, he saw a man of diverse composition. Not so the cop who came with fear upon his face, looked at a person with no name who was of a different race. Anthony walked outside in a post-traumatic nightmare, hands upon his sides, but the policeman didn't care. He went off his meds, so it's ready, aim, kill. The unarmed, naked man lay dead. His name was Anthony Hill. I've been uh, reading up on Oregon history, and there's a lot of good parts, and there's a lot of bad parts. And I'll sing about both of them. But uh, in light of the um, Bundy brothers uh, claiming that uh, former Paiute, uh, well, Paiute land, not former, but you know, un, un, you know, unceded uh, land stolen by our government uh, that uh, that uh, it was it's traditionally Paiute land and <clears throat> apparently was a, a fairly a fairly well appreciated uh, uh, haven for migrating birds that most people in the area approved of, but but not the Bundys. But the Bundys re represent a very uh, important and dominant uh, streak of Oregon politics over the centuries. You want to understand what happens today? You gotta know how things got that way So let's look back from the present date And examine the history of a state As with the rest of the stolen land Mass murder is how it began From the first days of the territory Only white men could own property And to them the land was given for free From Waloa to the Pacific Sea Taken by force and then handed out Leaving no room for the slightest doubt That a white homeland was the intent and to make it certain what was meant, signs were posted that clearly read, leave by dusk or end up dead. Best get out of town before the sun goes down. Cause if you're not white, that's probable cause here in the land of the sunset laws. Oregon Territory's constitution explained the methods of exclusion. It wasn't subtle, it was all too clear. Non-white people not welcome here. And when Oregon joined the USA, it entered the Union with laws this way. Salem could fine and lash and kill to enforce the white land's will. Best get out of town before the sun goes down. Cause if you're not white, that's probable cause. Here in the land of the sunset laws. the war of brave 
gray and blue. Exclusion laws were passed anew. They weren't repealed for 60 more years after the Klansman rule of Walter Pierce. It feels a lot like nothing's changed. Looks a lot like a firing range. Who owns the land? Who keeps the order? From Portland to the California border. Best get out of town before the sun goes down. Cause if you're not white, that's probable cause here in the land of the sunset laws. I think, um, you know, now to the good side. Um, the, uh, there's still people dying in this song, but anyway. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, even my cheery songs have death in them. No wonder they don't play me on the radio. I mean, you know how, like when I was young, there, there was this, there's this reputation that people had, like, you know, the old, the people, the middle-aged people, when I was little, you know, the sort of older middle-aged people were, were all, if they were men, they were all World War II veterans. And they, um, and the, the uh, you know, the, the sort of dominant idea about these, this, that whole generation was that they liked to tell war stories, which is total nonsense. Like, I mean, they don't. And actually, nobody who's been involved with combat likes to tell war stories. I've never met anybody who's been involved with combat who likes to tell. They do it because they feel they have to, uh, you know, to, to impart knowledge and, and, and to warn people. And, but nobody likes to talk about these things. And, and the same is true of a lot of activists uh, who have, you know, had their heads beaten in by the police. And it's this kind of thing you'd rather forget, you know. It was something you did because you had to and not because you were glorifying, you know, getting your head beat in, you know. And... Um, <laughs> I find that it's true of the, you know, there are certain people in this room who are of the 60s generation who have seen quite a lot of, uh, of all sorts of things involving police beating the heads in of demonstrators and a lot of other things along those lines. And, and, uh, and there's a lot of people who don't like to talk about that either. And, and, um, and a lot of people don't know what happened. And I thought um, I was in the bathroom of the rock gym on uh, on uh, 12th and, and um, wherever that Burnside and uh, and they had this sign that said uh, and it was about uh, people rock climbers going to you know hiking out into the mountains and how to the etiquette of being a rock climber right and it's, it would like pack out pack in that kind of thing and it said uh, don't be don't uh, don't be a, a bystander uh, don't stand by stand up you know like with regards to litter, <laughs> but I thought that's a nice idea. I mean, this song doesn't have to do with litter, but. <laughs> this sprawling nation, the rising of a generation. It started slow and then gained speed. Nobody knew where it would lead. First there were marches, then there were more. Way too many to keep score. They shut down classes, couldn't learn. Once they ascertained how napalm burned, they had to find out how to defy. People stood up Held by the military brass, there were cities filled with CS gas. Real wars, war games, recruitment centers up in flames. Light a match, then in a flash, draft cards turned to ash. Thousands moved across the border, refusing military orders. Every army base in the USA had an anti-war cafe. There are times when you just can't comply. People stood up, cause they couldn't stand by. Soldiers insisted on free will, put down their guns, refused to kill. Newspapers of the underground ubiquitously could be found across the country, across the sea, throughout the ranks of the military. Take a grenade, pull out the pin, 
praise be to Ho Chi Minh. Another fragging every night, a war that many refused to fight. Bombs were falling, some asked why. People stood up, cause they couldn't stand by. The ruling classes with all their powers Shook inside their ivory towers They were brought to their knees back then That's why we don't have the draft again Even back then, some of them knew They had to be careful what they tried to do Rulers who miscalculate Can lose control of their ship of state In order to govern you need consent And all of that just up and went In 68 came the reply People stood up Cause they couldn't stand by stood up, cause they couldn't stand by. People stood up, cause they couldn't stand by. Yeah. When uh, I, f I first started um, meeting lots of Palestinians um, when um, the, first, the Second Intifada uh, began and, and I was uh, bumming around the northeastern U.S. with Juana there in the back row and, uh, <laughs> and hanging out with a lot of Palestinians and, <laughs> and it, was, it was a new experience for me. Um, uh, not the first time I had met a Palestinian, but the first time I had met continually Palestinians every day. Um, you know, they were very actively involved with the movement, um, it, you know, to stop uh, U.S. aid to Israel at the time, and then that movement uh, declined rapidly after 9-11 for certain reasons, having to do with fear. But um, this is a poem about a woman in, in Chicago. Rasmea was born in Palestine a year before she had to flee. Her family left their home at gunpoint. Since then, she's been a refugee. She lived a hard life in the camps. Her dad had to move away, try to support his family from way out in Michigan, USA. When Rasmea was first arrested, not much older than a kid, there had been a bombing, and the next thing the authorities did was round up the whole neighborhood. 500 women, children, and men. They tortured Rasmea. They only stopped when they extracted their confession. She did what she had to do, having no idea when her ordeal would be through. After 10 years and a dungeon in the land of stolen fates, she was sent to Jordan from where she moved to the United States. Rasmea made a life here helping refugees like her, adapting to their new lives and the people they once were, until her home was raided because she had once checked the wrong box for not mentioning the confession produced by the electroshocks. Again, Rasmea was arrested, once again stripped of citizenship. Some drink deeply of their freedom, some only get a little sip. The fact that she was tortured was not considered of import. Only Israeli military evidence was recognized by the American court. Now they say they will deport her from this city on the lake. They say that 20 years ago, she made a technical mistake. They say Rasmea is a terrorist, but I'd say it would seem. Rasmea Ode is the victim of a terrorist regime. <laughs> I'll do a song about a friend of mine who's, who's uh, probably sleeping right now because he's, he's nocturnal, but, uh, but he lives nearby. Saeed Banur is a friend of mine, but I'm lucky to know him. To be sure, he's from a land called Palestine, from the town of Beit Zahur. His house was a mile from where Jesus was born and a mile from a military base. He grew up under occupation. Such a lovely town, but such a terrifying place. When the first intifada started, Sa'id was facing off with tanks. So many of the youth then became martyrs, and Sa'id almost joined their ranks. He was running from a death squad. Soldiers shot him in the chest and in the back. They shot him six times all together, but Sa'ed said, you guys just don't have the knack. He wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. They tried hard to kill him, but he just spat in their eye. He wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. A soldier came and kicked him to turn him over. A blow that broke four of his bones. A local doctor came to try to help him. The soldiers said, you leave him alone. It was hours before they took him to hospital where he got surgery. 
But after they cut out half his lung and patched him back together most sloppily, he wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. They tried hard to kill him, but he just spat in their eye. He wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. To stop the Intifada, they tried different strategies. First they tried packing the prisons. Then they tried brutality. Neither one of these things worked. So they tried assassination. But now he's sitting right in front of me, working at his station. Yes, they tried to kill Sa'id Banura, and they succeeded with so many more. But now Sa'id is a citizen of Portland, my neighbor by the Willamette River shore. Now Sa'id is a journalist reporting from his wheelchair, though 20 years ago he took six bullets, which is quite a lot more than his share. He wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. They tried hard to kill him, but he just spat in their eye. He wouldn't die. 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 Glad there's other people with as sick a sense of humor as I have. Because, <laughs> you know, you don't always get a laugh for that song, depending on the crowd. They're like, oh, this is, is this supposed to be funny? Am I supposed to? Yeah. So, yeah, I've been writing songs on, based on what's been happening in the news and then based on reflections of of historical events that are related to those things that happen in the news, which is kind of my MO. But um, it's, uh, it, was, it was like one of the most horrific events of last summer, and it quickly was eclipsed by um, another horrific event three days later, but um, there was a truck in Austria. When the bomb went off that killed your mother, and you left at midnight with your sister and your father. When you spent your first night sleeping amid the mortars. As your family made its way to the Turkish border. As you said, it saw the dead and dying all around you. When there was nowhere you could hide, nothing you could do. When you were living in a tent in Turkey. There along with a million other refugees When your father said We must keep heading north to Sweden That there we might live in a house again As you slept out in the open Beneath the darkness of the sky Did you dream about your mama And her hazel eyes Did you miss Aleppo And your nanny Nanita did you wish you could be home in Syria? When you crammed into the raft that took you to dry land, did your spirits lift a little when your father kissed the sand? Did you listen to him say, now we must go to Macedonia? Did you hear somebody tell him it was better than Bulgaria? And as you ran across the border, that took you out of Greece And you saw your father Being hit by the police Did you miss Aleppo And your nanny, Nanita? Did you wish you could be home in Syria? When you packed into the truck Did you feel the trepidation? As it moved along the highway Closer towards your destination how soon did people realize? When did they begin to shout? How hard was your heart pounding before all the air ran out? What was your final dream from which you would not awaken? Did you wonder why your young life now was going to be taken? Or did you just miss Aleppo and your nanny, Nanita? Did you wish you could be home in Syria? Did you miss Aleppo and your nanny, Nanita? Did you wish you could be home in Syria? Did you wish you could be home in Syria?
years. Um, I, yeah, I just, I, I've never been to Syria, but when I went to Lebanon, I realized that, um, that there's a lot of very prosperous people in Lebanon and they have Filipino nannies. And um, like everybody I know in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's more typical. And you have maids and nannies and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's very common there. And uh, people, when they think of refugees, they often tend to think of poor, uneducated people. But actually, when you're talking about Lebanese and Syrians, in a lot of cases, you're talking about multilingual people who grew up with nannies. You know, um, but uh, which, which some cynical people say that's why the Germans want the want the Syrians. You know, because if you, if you got to if you're going to pick and choose refugees, if you need immigrants and you need to increase your declining population, and you have to choose between uh, Syrians and Eritreans, well, then you choose the Syrians if you're looking for people with college degrees. You know, but um, not that it's a choice. You know, they'll come. They'll come. Anyway. What else are you gonna do? Um, but um, but all this, all the refugees makes me think about other refugees in, in the past. And I was raised uh, partially by a refugee, and um, and I uh, and it's and you know one of those things about if you knew anybody who uh, died before the web, uh, you know, or you know before the web was very old, you know, you search for them on the web, they're not there, you know, <laughs> you know, unless it's like somebody famous, you know, but. So if you look on the web, the one reference to my former nanny um, in New York City uh, is that she flew from New York to London in 1978 or 77, and uh, that she was born and that she had uh, and that she died. Uh, that's the record of her existence on the web. So I thought I'd add to it a little bit. Lola was born the First World War. Only just ended three years before. In 77, she took a flight, told a reporter who asked her that it was all right. 2002 is a year that she died. She lived in Manhattan on the Upper West Side. If you look on the web, that's almost all that will show. There once was a Lola, Alia Lauro. She always said that she was from England. But after she died, I learned she came from the mainland. The last kinder transport was the one she was on. And she spent her youth then being bombed in London. She met a soldier, followed him back. How many kids she raised? Who can keep track? Only two of her own, but so many others would follow. My nanny Lola, Ali Alaro. She always said she never had a problem with the gangsters they said were so bad. She would laugh loudly, as she often did, saying I knew all the gangsters when they were wee kids. She said not one child should be forsaken. Maybe because her own childhood had been taken A woman of joy A woman of sorrow A lady named Lola Ali Aloro As I grew up, I still kept in touch with this woman who had affected so many so much. My lady of laughter, my mother of mirth, who 
seem to know so deeply what laughter was worth. There's no stumbling stone to recall when she came. And she long ago changed both her first and last name. But now there's a song so someone out there might know. There once was a Lola, a Leah Lauro. There once was a Lola, a Leah Lauro. There once was a Lola, a Leah Lauro. I was, um, I was, I was actually scared to go to Germany the first time I went there. Um, and then I, I quickly realized that, uh, that it was the most, uh, friendly, um, uh, self-reflective society in the world. Never been to Rwanda, so I don't know, but as far as the places I've been, it's an amazing country. And, uh gets a bad rap for certain understandable reasons. But um, uh, there's a, been an art project uh, since 1992. Um, uh, an artist whose name does not appear in the song, and now I can't remember his name, but a German artist from Cologne uh, who started up a, a public art project, and I think the best art is public art. And, um, and he started uh, putting these little, little stones, um, little bronze stones, on the sidewalk all over Germany and now in other countries as well uh, to commemorate uh, people who were taken one night by the Nazis or to commemorate, commemorate people who, who died in the resistance or who, who left uh, because in order not to die and you know that all those kinds of things and it's, all, it's always just a tiny little bit of information their name their date of birth date of death where they died and uh, and then if you want to know more, you can find out. You know their names are there. The internet exists and all that. But um, but they're called Stolpersteins. Stolperstein uh, would be the plural, right? And I and, and I don't know. Fuck. Anybody speak German? Stolperstein is the singular. Whatever the plural is, Stolpersteine. Uh, but uh, that's it's um it's um they're that means stumbling stones in English. <laughs> First showed up in Deutschland, camping on the Rhine. The first town that I went to was also the first sign of the kind of self-reflection that had gone on around here. Indications everywhere, so shiny and so clear. Look down at the sidewalk, where a little light is shown, stumble upon a stumbling stone. What did this place once look like? Who lived on this block Can't be recreated But you can partially take stock Look down at the sidewalk For a little bronze square Read the words engraved upon it That says who was living there Before they were taken away To the dark unknown Stumble upon A stumbling stone Little squares all over You'll find them all around not much information on them, they don't make a sound. But if your imagination is anything like mine, then all you need to trigger it is one lone stoper stein. Take a moment to remember, as you look down from your phone, stumble upon a stumbling stone. There are six little squares here, one for each member of one family that was taken. One morning in December, the youngest child was two, the eldest one was ten. Within a year, each one of them had died at Sachsenhausen. Their bodies burnt to ashes, flesh, and blood, and bone stumbled upon a stumbling stone. And every time I see them, I wish I would see more embedded in the sidewalks on so many other shores. Just one stone to remember Each one who met their fate Had all the slave plantations In all the torture states But for some it's safer Just to leave the dead alone 
stumble upon a stumbling stone. A stumble upon a stumbling stone. I was touring around uh, the West Coast in November. And we stopped, uh, we spent a couple nights at a place called the Black Butte Center for Railroad, Railroad Culture in uh, Weed, California, which I love the name of that town. Now you can, you can buy weed in Weed too. But uh, uh, so the Black Butte Center for Railroad Culture is like, you just can't believe that you're there until you get there. And like, if you're a fan of early 20th century American labor history and you've read a lot of stuff about hobos and railroads and union organizers hopping trains and you romanticize that stuff, uh, as I do, then you, you go to this place and you, you, just, you just feel like you've been transported to like 19, you know, 12. You know, it's just uh, quite, a, quite a place. And, uh, and, you know, it's right next to a train line. Um, and, um, the tra it's, you know, you, you just, you're right there. So if the hobos are, the, there's a place where the trains, you know, they stop to do stuff, right? Whatever, that railroad yard. So it's like right there. And, and the, so the people are hopping trains, they get off there. Uh, and even if they're just getting off for a little while or a few hours or a few days, you know, there's the center for railroad culture right there. And what, what it is, is boxcars that people live in that are not on tracks, but are like off the tracks, near the tracks. People are living in, you know, railroad boxcars that were actually designed for, for that purpose, you know, back in the day for the conductors and stuff. And, uh, and then there's campfires and, you know, all this. And it's actually the privately owned land, so nobody can mess with it. And, uh, and it's just a wonderful little haven for, for uh, you know, train hopping crowd. And... Uh, never hopped a train in my life and I have no intention to because it's dangerous and I don't like doing dangerous things. Um, but I have, I just never understood the, the attraction of doing dangerous things. I mean, life is dangerous enough without <laughs> doing stuff like that, you know, skiing. Like, I, I, you know, I've never skied because every winter the kids come home from vacation, uh, you know, in the Northeast where I grew up with broken bones. And so, you know, you could put two and two together. They, they go skiing, they break their bones. I think I'll skip that, you know. <laughs> My parents weren't into skiing, so, it, you know, it never became an issue or anything. <laughs> but I was hanging around the campfire there and thinking, gosh, somebody dies in all my songs. I need to have a song about campfires because they're lovely. And um, so I wrote one. <laughs> is cooking in the cauldron There's a freight train passing by Plane streaking through the night air Way up in the sky Nearby the leaves are shimmering And they rustle in the breeze Blowing smoke upon our faces And the guitars on our a message from the mountain saying now here we are around this campfire beneath these stars someone throws a log on lighting up our faces and the more or less together state of each of our shoelaces someone tells a story of a place she'd like to go and it feels like nothing's changed much since a thousand years ago blowing embers of a pipe the passing of a jar around this campfire Stars. Out there in the world, kids 
are sleeping in their cots. Fishermen are hauling nets, tying fishing knots. Somewhere someone's dancing, someone's drilling a gas well. Someone's writing memoirs, sitting in a prison cell. Some of us are wondering, is there life up there on Mars, around this campfire, beneath these stars? And um, I, I toured a, several tours in, in, in Scotland and in Australia, New Zealand, and the U.S. with my uh, friend Alistair Hewlett, who was a phen phenomenal guitar player and, and uh, songwriter from Glasgow, and um, and who lived in Sydney for many years too, and uh, introduced me to Australia and New Zealand. I organized a two-week tour of the U.S. Uh, for he and I, and then he retaliated by organizing a seven-week tour of Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> so it was like, it was amazing, and uh, and uh, we went everywhere. And at seven weeks, you can cover every city in both New Zealand and Australia quite easily, and um, and a lot of towns too. And. Uh, he died very unexpectedly uh, just a couple years after that. Uh, suddenly came down with cancer and uh, was within three weeks of any of us hearing about it, he was dead. And, um, and so it, you know, tends to make you uh, think about the guy when he was living. And uh, I wrote these words uh, soon after he died and never came up with any music for them. And then I was just messing around with them a couple months ago and did. <laughs> festivals, think of double dates, think of being searched by cops outside the prison gates. I think of dark-haired women, one or two, or maybe four. I think of singing songs together, planning to sing more. I think of Queensland summer, swimming in cool waters, you and me in Woodford and Athena's daughters. I think of driving down the highway, feeling like the lucky few. I think of grievous angels. Graham and Emmy Lou. Think of Maralinga and the BLF, seventh chords and open tunings and the mighty treble clef. I think of 1917 and the red flag flying high above the streets of Glasgow beneath the blood red sky. I think of Roaring Jack. How you would repine of decades fueled in equal parts by politics and wine. I think of meeting friends, both old and new. Think of driving down the highway with Graham and Henny Lou. Think of Aotearoa gazing at the stars. I think of that drunken driver who totaled our car. I think of playing in the bunker, how that audience had spunk. Half of them old folkies, half of them young punks. I think of all the miners who slowly fade away. I think about the moment when I heard it was your day. I think about this CD that I got from you when I'm driving down the highway with Graham and Emmy Lou. Driving down the highway With Graham and Emmy Lou So 
I, um, I'm so excited about pot legalization. Um, <laughs> even though I'm not excited about the rents going up and, and all the people moving to Oregon because pot is legal. Uh, and, you know, but that's really not a, their fault. It's, of course, it's the fault of the system not having rent control and all that. But uh, so I'm, I'm the victim of legalization and, uh, and of Oregon being such a hip place to live. But I'm also the beneficiary since I can walk five blocks away, or actually two blocks away. Um, yeah, now that there's not, not only are there, are there five strip clubs within two blocks of, my, of our place, I've yet to ever set foot in a strip club in my life, but, we, but if I wanted to, it's very, you know, you could pretty much stumble in any, any direction. You know that there's more strip clubs in Portland than any other city in the country. Okay, so, uh, but now, along with the strip clubs, you can buy pot, so it's, it's, I like that a lot better. And uh, seems much more. Um, and uh, so I, I wrote this song after I walked to Division Street and bought my first bag of legal weed <laughs> in Oregon. I've done it before in, in Washington and British Columbia, but. a century there was a prohibition which put a heck of a lot of people in a difficult position each year millions went to prison for planting the wrong seeds imprisoned for the crime of smoking weed imprisoned in their millions especially those black or brown or wearing long hair and hippie clothes but I stand here before you with quite a bit of pleasure to tell you all about a successful ballot measure it's legal now it's legal now take a bow it's legal now Politicians were useless, almost all the same, playing the military-industrial prison complex game. But the regular people weren't nearly as dumb, so some folks took initiative and we passed a referendum. Now people don't have to risk arrest if they want to treat their ills with something other than pharmaceutical pills. And if you just want to take a hit, because you like the feeling, you can safely walk the streets or just stare up at the ceiling. It's legal now. It's legal now. Take a bow. It's legal now. Now that pot's legit, at least in large parts of the West, we can get to work legalizing all the rest. The poppies and the coca leaves and all the other plants. Safer, regulated, will be the official stance. The CIA will have to find another way to operate. The FBI will need a new MO for their whole police state. When we legalize it all, from the west coast to the east, then we can say right here, in the belly of the beast, it's legal now. It's legal now. Take a bow. It's legal now. <laughs> Steel birds streak through the sky above the Syrian Levant. The pilot flew the plane all the way from Nantes. Explosions rock the cities in this proxy civil war. So many innocents killed, they've long since lost the score. Jean-Pierre fired a missile and was heard to say he wished he could be home in France at his favorite cafe, not fighting in a conflict that shows no sign of ever ending as the eagles of death were descending. The bars were filled with people on a balmy Friday night out enjoying the weather, having a drink or a bite, watching football in a stadium, hearing a live band, washing dishes in a restaurant, or shopping for the latest brand. The luckiest ones stayed home, catching a TV show, not knowing how glad they'd be that they didn't go out that evening to join a war they had just last week been protesting when the eagles of death were descending. 
The right is overjoyed, prepared to do their best to try, to use these acts of terror to continue to deny asylum for the refugees who are largely fleeing the same men who took over their towns and cities at the very same time when they escaped the carnage to attempt to cross the sea to be refused safe haven in the land of fraternity, where this war that has come home keeps rivening and rending as the eagles of death were descending. That's for Paris. You know, the band that was playing that night was called the Eagles of Death Metal. And they're not a death metal band either, but, but it's a great name. Yeah, and then they say a picture can, what, a thousand words in it. It's true. Did you get up in the morning, see your kids off to school? As you headed to the office, was it hard to keep your cool? When you saw the news and the picture of the boy on the beach just down the coast from the ancient town of Troy, did you think about the victims of these most uncivil wars when you saw the children washing up upon our shores? Did you hear the pundits talking? Did you hear them say, we must have law and order. All these migrants cannot stay. Did you see the people walking, trying not to look at the headlines splashed around them and this photo someone took? Did you want to shout at each of them, knock on every door and tell them there are children washing up upon our shores? Is the thought seared in your mind when you see your son or daughter of this child from Kobani? face down beside the water. Did you keep on asking since then? What if it had been you? Do you just wish that you could find out what just one person could do? Is his image all around you? As the sweat comes from your pores, there are children washing up upon our shores. You just keep on asking yourself the question why as you make dinner for your children. This one had to die if you just hit the road from England a few days south and east. Do you think about how you could, and once you're there at least, you could leave a flower and hear the wind implore? There are children washing up upon our shores. There are children washing up upon our shores. So the, um, the uh, I know, you don't feel like clapping after a song like that, right? It's okay, you know. It's, <laughs> but uh, but what, the one, one thing that's really great about anniversaries is that um, it's an excuse to write a song. And um, uh, to, uh, he's, he's gesturing, he's gesticulating. Yeah, people in, in the, in the, at the end of the song, if people, I mean, I'm only doing three more, but if people want to um, go in, in, in or out, check out the studio, I mean, yeah, you, you feel free. You don't, don't, uh, don't be frozen. Um, so uh, the, the, the great thing about 100th anniversaries especially is it's a really good excuse for a song, I figure. And, uh, and this uh, April 24th will be the 100th anniversary of the uh, Easter Rebellion. And in Ireland, and um, and uh, Rachel and I are having a baby, which is due on May first, and um, I will not be in Ireland on <laughs> April twenty fourth. <laughs> but uh, normally I'm in Europe in April and May, and uh, not this year, and uh, and uh, so no no going to Ireland for that. But um, but there will be plenty of musicians there, so yeah, it's okay. My great-grandfather was a refugee from a place called Ireland. He didn't want to leave home, but when you're a slave, nothing goes how you might have planned. Like most of the island, he had nothing to eat. He survived by going away. But if he hadn't starved and if he hadn't left, perhaps he would have lived to see the day. When after centuries of subjugation under English queens and kings, 
maintain the movement of the Irish Spring. When things were set in motion around one Easter morning to move from colony to nation. When through the foggy dew could be seen lines of marching men heading towards a country's liberation. Then a century ago, on April 24th, suddenly one day the spell was broken. For six days and nights, all across the island, the spirit of resistance had spoken. Quickly it was clear, even the deaf could hear, the sounds of two armies battling, and the bullets of the Irish Spring. Buildings lay in ruins when the rebels had surrendered, a battle lost, a war only begun. Chains once thrown off don't go back on easily, and soon the British army was on the run. The Doyle convened and declared the Republic, a nation among the others on the earth. A nation with a people, with a culture and a history celebrated from Liverpool to Perth. A nation with a memory that's in the songs it sings with the music of the Irish Spring. The revolution left unfinished, you can hear many people say, on the streets of Derry and Belfast. But in all 32 counties you'll hear many people talking of the struggles and the martyrs of the past. Of those who dared stand up and teach us through example what it means to sacrifice it all. Of those who demonstrated if they believe that they are free, only then can they possibly stand tall. Of Connolly and Pierce and all those who gave their lives that they might hear the bells of freedom ring with the rising of the Irish Spring. With the rising of the Irish Spring. So I got two more. And um, this uh, next one is a is a shout along, and I need to teach you your parts. And uh, it is uh, it is uh, in, dedicated to my landlord. I don't even know what his name is, but uh, but he has uh, I believe. But it's a guy. I've seen him. I've, I've seen him. I mean, the manager. I, he was wearing a pink shirt, and he looked kind of nice. But I mean, if you can judge by a pink shirt, if whether somebody's nice, I don't know. But. Uh, he looked he looked like a nice guy and it, and you know to his credit we are paying what they call below market rates and, and whoever the heck determines that I don't know but it's the, I don't like them and, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, like you know civilized countries uh, you know like in Europe have something called rent control and um, and it's something that we need here because uh, I mean, it's, it seems, I guess it's easier for them to have it in the way because they know that there's only so much land, right? So like in a place like Denmark, you got Denmark, it's small, there's five million people, there's enough room for them, but it's not like somebody can just go buy up a whole bunch of land and like, that, that's, a, that's a problem. You do, there isn't a whole bunch of land. So they have a law in Denmark, which I love, which is, um, which, you know, actually could be a problem for some members of my extended family, but that's okay. Um, but it is uh, that nobody can own more than one house for more than two years so you can own more than one house for for up to two years so they it's very flexible so like if you're moving you got two years to do it you know but then you have to move and uh and you have to sell the house that you're not living in uh, or rent or you cannot rent it to somebody you cannot be a landlord wow. you have to sell it or live in it and denmark is one of the very most prosperous countries in the world, so I think they're doing all right. You know, it's it's not a problem. You know, people are doing fine with uh, the inability to be landlords uh, for <laughs> lots. You know, for more than two years, um, and then people get around the whole thing a little, and w which is also cool because then they because then they rent for really cheap. You know, Denmark is an expensive country, but if you are renting from somebody who owns their house for more than two years, you know, as the renter, you have the advantage. 
they are breaking the law by renting to you, and so you can, so, you know, it's totally like the reverse, you know? It's like the landlord has to be like, oh, please don't tell anybody, you know? It's fantastic. But, um, yeah. But anyway, I think we need rent control, and um, so this is, uh, there's going to be a demonstration on Friday, uh, 4.30 p.m. Friday um, at, uh, at City Hall uh, in Portland um, against, uh, in, related to the, what they call the, the rent emergency. Um, and uh, so the chorus to this song, uh, let's see, how does it go? Uh, so it's like, so I say, so rent control, and then, and then you say rent control, right? So rent control, rent control, rent control, rent control, because that's the way everything should be. Rent control, rent control, rent control, rent control, the choice of a democracy. Okay? That's the chorus. Uh, you'll know when it comes because I'll be shouting rent control. <laughs> they say the economy is booming, though on this there's much debate. It depends on how well you're getting by. Development is zooming. Some folks think that's great, and now you can legally get high. But even that can't mask the pain that so many of us feel When we're paying so much rent To be homeless in the rain is so nasty and so real Looks like the good times have come and went Rent control Rent control Rent control, rent control. Cause that's the way everything should be Rent control Rent control Rent control, rent control. The choice of a democracy in some places they make laws that limit corporations, that keep greedy landlords in check. Here we have the cause, but we lack the politicians with enough spine in their necks for rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Cause that's the way everything should be. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. The choice of a democracy. Every day that passes, why we don't have rent control is an insult to the human race. Time to get up off our asses, take back the city that they stole, put the greedy bankers in their place with rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Cause that's the way everything should be. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. The choice of a democracy. One more time. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Cause that's the way everything should be. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. Rent control. The choice of a democracy. The choice of a democracy. We'll do one more and thank you all so much for coming and it's been such a pleasure and if uh, anybody uh, if you know any musicians who want to record an album I highly recommend Big Red Studio here it's, I've, I've recorded everything that I've put out since 2007 here and and I highly recommend the place it's, it's an advertisement an advertisement for a studio that he's not getting rich though so it's okay you know it's, <laughs> So uh, yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna close with a song that um, is somewhat I guess I guess somewhat well known in, in English, although I don't uh, remember ever hearing it uh, in English. But it's been translated into lots of different languages. Uh, it's but it's originally in German, and I'm gonna do it in German. And um, even though I barely speak the language, I, I I can pronounce it pretty well. It's one of those things. Being a musician, you you can usually learn to pronounce things. And but. Um, Although I'm told my Arabic really sucks, so I just I gave up. <laughs> I gave up on trying to learn Arabic songs, but for now. But um, but the uh, when in, when the uh, co I mean the communists and, and uh, Jews and so many other people were being arrested en masse, of course, in Germany and and back during the during the war, and they were um, one of the many uh, rules in the in the concentration. Uh, camp uh, where this song was written was that you could not sing 
songs that uh, had been written before. Like, you know, you couldn't sing the popular left-wing songs of the day, um, of which there were many. And you couldn't, uh, you know, you couldn't sing, you know, anything like that, that people knew that, you know. But, uh, but they did actually uh, allow people to um, uh, write songs and sing them on certain occasions when they were showcasing the concentration camp to show that it wasn't as bad as it really was, that sort of thing, which they did regularly, you know. So um, some uh, musicians and other folks in the camp uh, wrote a, a song, which actually was well received by the SS uh, who were listening to it at the time, um, oddly enough, and banned later. Um, but um, and you know it might not show much. You know it, do it doesn't credit the SS's intelligence much if they thought this was a song that was not a political song. It's hard to imagine. Uh, but I was apparently in the in the records of the of the performance, uh, which which it's hard to imagine the the scene too because you like you got a concentration camp with ten thousand people in it all singing the song and they they orchestrated it so that every chorus got more people joined in and I'm and trying to imagine ten thousand concentration camp uh, prisoners singing the chorus to this song is just tough uh, to really picture, but it's called, uh, in, in the English, it's the Pete Bog Soldiers, and, uh, and basically each verse describes um, their, this, their situation, up and down the guards are marching, uh, you know, the, the, uh, if we're facing death, the guns and the barbed wire, and, and we are the Pete Bog Soldiers marching with our spades to the moor. And, uh, and, uh, in, and at the end they say, you know, no, no more will we be the peat bog soldiers. And apparently uh, the SS people thought of themselves as peat bog soldiers. Which I, mm -hmm. Takes all kinds, I guess. <laughs> Hans Wader is a German uh, s singer who, who's most well known for singing this song. And my version is actually very little like his, so <laughs> no <laughs> apologies to any Hans Wader fans out there.
when the world has gone crazy. And it's all becoming clear when they're gunning down our comrades. And it seems the end is near as they're loading up the launchers for the tear gas grenades. We can take off our bandanas and kiss behind the barricades. When it's madness all around, and you can see this at a glance, we will sing and we will cry, we will laugh and we will dance. As they shout their marching orders beneath the helicopter blades, we shall seize the moment for a kiss behind the barricades. They will try to break our spirit, and at times they may succeed, but our love for the world is stronger than their greed. When the building is surrounded and hope begins to fade, in my final hour, a kiss behind the barricades. As the movement grows, there will be hills and bends, but at the center of the struggle are your lovers and your friends. And the more we hold each other up, the less we can be swayed. Here's to love and solidarity and a kiss behind the barricades. And thanks for listening, all you people out there on the web, whoever you are. And uh, I'll, I'm going to read all those comments later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.